Well, it is just past three o'clock, which means it is time for another Vinnie Mark webinar. Now, the topic today is the changing face of Sauvignon Blanc in South Africa. And you might ask, but why? Why Sauvignon Blanc of all the cultivars that we could focus on? Well, there are a number of valid answers to that question. For starters, it's South Africa's most sold cultivar by the liter. According to Savas, it more than doubled its domestic sales in South Africa between 2009 and 2019. As far as exports are concerned, in the UK alone, more than 7 million litres of Sauvignon Blanc was consumed in 2019. Now, of course, COVID put a little bit of a dampener on that smooth ramp on the domestic scene, but internationally, even in the States, Sauvignon Blanc was the fastest growing cultivar by sales for the last two years in a row. So what we're hoping to do today is answer the question, what is the secret behind Sauvignon Blanc's momentum and how can South African producers better position themselves to meet the market where it's at? And that might be through best practice in the cellar or in the marketplace. Now, this all seems pretty simple, right? But the tricky thing with Sauvignon Blanc is that it's so diverse in its expression around the world that one has to really slow down and ask the question, well, which Sauvignon Blanc are we talking about? I mean, lovers of the cultivar will know that it can present itself as the respectable Dr. Jekyll or the feral Mr. Hyde. You know, is it charming Snow White or Post Malone? Now, in order to be able to answer our question properly, we've assembled a panel of Sauvignon Blanc specialists to help us along the way. So our panel today consists of Charles Hopkins, the multi, 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 multi-award winning winemaker at De Grendel, and also a widely recognized Sauvignon Blanc authority. We have Nushka de Foss, the winemaker at the Biodynamic Wine Estate, Reinecke. We have Adi Abuerta, cellar master at Kleiner Zelzer. Uh, he was the, previously the Diner Club young winemaker back in 2010. But more importantly, a decade later, he's a little less young, but far more experienced as the chairperson of the Sauvignon Blanc South Africa Association. We then have Alexander Greer, a member of the winemaking team at Vieira Wines and the fourth generation in the Greer family to be making wine for the estate. And finally, we have Dr. Karim Kutsia, she's a doctor of agricultural enology and a seasoned panel judge for the International Concours Mundial de Sauvignon. And she'll be bringing her uniquely international perspective to the table today. So to kick off the discussion, I wanted to unpack a little bit of South Africa's relationship with Sauvignon Blanc. Now, we have record of it being planted in Constantia in 1880. Uh, and, uh, but as it stands, the oldest block of South Africa today is a little patch of bush vines in the Swartland that was only planted in 1965. The grapes from these vines go into the Spice Roots Fino Sherry style uh, bottling called the Amos Block Perpetual Reserve. Now, phylloxera aside, which hit in 1886 and caused absolute chaos, there's surely a story to tell between Constantia 1880, Swartland 1965, and then 1977, which was the first time that it was bot bottled as a single cultivar wine. So who better to tell us that story than the chairperson of the SA Sauvignon Blanc Association, Adia Buerta. So Adia, thanks for joining us today. Uh, I'm hoping you can start us off by giving a sort of broad strokes history lesson on how Sauvignon Blanc came to South Africa and how it became entrenched in the national vineyard. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I must say, I think you you probably answered everything. Um, it is it <laughs> the, the history of Sauvignon Blanc in South Africa is is isn't pinpointed yet, and, and there is no actual date and time that it was planted. Um, you are correct in saying that uh, the first plantings that is uh, and was. Um, notified or that we know about was uh, Constantia in the 1880s and uh, we all know that you know planting material back in the day was uh, was uh, <laughs> full of virus uh, planting material was not good um, and it, it wasn't only phylloxera it was uh, even before phylloxera probably in the 1940s that uh, that a lot of those first plantings of Sauvignon Blanc was already uprooted and then Sauvignon Blanc went into probably a bit of hibernation and uh, again it was it was only probably in the 1970s that uh, that that it resurfaced and um, you know from there on onwards it just grew exponentially um, 
I think uh, as South Africans, and uh, we we started we started liking the grape, and we started figuring out that it works. Um, as you mentioned, I think the oldest block of Sauvignon Blanc that is still standing in South Africa is a spice root. Um, I think the second oldest one that we know of, uh, Charles, and you can correct me here, yeah, but I think it is in Durbanville um, on the farm called Blumendal. Um, I am not 100% sure, as far as I know, it is still in the ground. I'm not sure um, if, if, if something changed in the past year or two. Um, but yeah, what an amazing. We, we know that it comes from France. We know that the exceptional wines um, that they make in the Loire and in, 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 in Bordeaux um, from Sauvignon Blanc and its, uh, its partners there. But how it actually came to South Africa, we don't know. Um, from a planting perspective at the moment, uh, just some interesting info that uh, the biggest plantings of, of Sauvignon Blanc is actually in Stellenbosch. And um, I think Charles will have something to say about that. Uh, we, can <laughs> we, can, we can chat about that later, but biggest plantings in Stellenbosch and the second most planting in, in, in the Robertson Valley. Um, two completely different sides and two completely different um, styles of wine that we produce. Um, and I really think that is what makes our South African Sauvignon Blanc so attractive. And I think uh, we can, the panel will probably um, talk about that a little bit later on as well. Um, I think that is what makes us so uni unique in, in, in making Sauvignon Blanc. And uh, I think that that should be our, our focus on in the future in promoting ourselves as Sauvignon Blanc producers, uh, as a Sauvignon Blanc producer in the world. So you, you mentioned virus early on, which seemed to almost cause a, a little bit of a false start, I guess, because a lot of the material yeah. was not going to produce the goods. How are we looking today as a, as a national vineyard? Uh, are we winning the war against virus or is it still a massive problem for us? Uh, I think it's still a massive problem. Not only, not only on Sauvignon Blanc, I think in, 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 in a lot of other um, varieties as well. Um, I think specifically on virus, it, uh, it, we all know that planting is a big financial or capital outlay. And, uh, you know, people are pushing these vineyards to the end of, of their production cycles, where 20 years ago, um, a, a, a 20 year cycle of a vineyard was, was the norm. I think up until now, it probably still is the norm. Um, I think with new new clones and new virus-free plant materials, I think there's a there's a brighter future for us. Um, and just the Sauvignon Blanc stats on that. I mean, in the in the last ten years, there has been a decline of uh, plantings or uh, of vineyard status in South Africa. So, in the total vineyard plantings in South Africa, has been declined for the last ten years, where Sauvignon Blanc plantings, on the other hand, has been growing over the last 10 years. And uh, it just shows that the, the, the cultivar and the wine is very popular. It shows that it is uh, not just profitable for the winemakers or the wine companies, but it is also profitable out of a farming point of view, which um, in these days of, of a key factor for us. Um, you know, we as wine producers cannot produce wine if there isn't any vineyards. And uh, luckily for us, I think Sauvignon Blanc has become a safe bet. And uh, we are slowly but surely figuring out exactly where to plant Sauvignon Blanc and uh, where it is making exceptional wines. Well, well, talking about profitability, I mean, I want to take a, a step offshore for a second because uh, it was, I mean, if we're going to examine one of the, the biggest success stories for Sauvignon Blanc, we have to go to Marlborough, right? And it was probably it was just less than 50 years ago that New Zealand planted their first Sauvignon Blanc vines. Now today, Marlborough is considered the, the throne room of, Marlborough, of, of Sauvignon Blanc, even though, as we know, it's indigenous to the south of France. So now, in your mind, what was it that triggered such a powerful reaction to Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc? I mean, it seemed to happen almost overnight. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually less than 40 years ago. Um, you know, in, in, in 1970, there was not a, there was no Sauvignon Blanc planted in, in New Zealand yet. And um, I, I think the success of, um, of Sauvignon Blanc is their unique flavor profile and also their consistency. I think their consistent uh, qualities combined with that very, very unique flavor profile 
high pyrazine, but also high thiol driven wines. And, you know, I think when, when the consumer started tasting this wine, um, you know, it was completely different um, uh, to anything else that they would have tasted coming from South Africa or coming from, from Europe. Um, you know, completely bonkers, explosive, in your face flavors. And, um, you know, I, 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 I read up a little bit and, and the first, the first Sauvignon Blanc exported from New, from New Zealand into the UK was only in 1986. And mm. that was with a brand called Cloudy Bay. In 1986, guys, that is, okay, I, it's a, I've, I was born already, but uh, very young. <laughs> and uh, it's not that long ago. Uh, if you think about it, how old the South African wine industry is. And um, they, after that, they exploded into an... A, a, a massive success story, but they were very clever about it, and 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 they never undersold themselves. But uh, probably it, it is a lot easier not to undersell yourself when there is such a big demand in it. Um, but they 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 were never in a position where they had to do these deals. They they were always in a position to sell their wines at uh, enormous prices, and we know for a fact now that. In the UK, in 35 years, they are probably the single best-selling um, brand of wine, and, and I call it the brand, the brand of Marlborough Sauvignon Blanc, um, in the world. So uh, a massive success story. I think the success started though with that very, very unique style of Sauvignon Blanc that they produce, and the consistency every year, consistent quality. I mean. As you said, this is it's a it's a, a massive success story, and obviously winemakers here in South Africa would have looked at that and said, you know, a new world country Sauvignon Blanc. We're a new world country. We have Sauvignon Blanc. There must have been some sort of rub off effects. What would you say were the most powerful influences of watching what happened in Marlborough? How did that affect the way Sauvignon Blanc was made here in South Africa or sold for that matter? Yeah, I think some people might hate me for this, but I. I think we learned a lot. I think we, I think we learned a lot in in how they were making it. I I, I think we also learned a lot by burning our own fingers, uh, by trying to be New Zealand. Um, you know, I think I think in the if you look at the the 1990s, um, early 2000s, we were hunting the New Zealand style. South Africans were trying to make New Zealand style something of Um You know, we wanted that expressive pyrazine driven wines we wanted that very expressive styles we you know that was that was the in thing that was what everybody was talking about um in the south african industry um i think we learned by mistake that we are not marlboro i think we learned by mistake that uh, we can make exceptional wines from our own vineyards in our own very unique south african styles we learned to experiment and to go searching for those very unique sites. And, you know, as, as, a, as a very proud South African wine producer, I think we really do make some of the, some of the best Sauvignon Blancs in the world. And again, back to my previous statement that we make unique styles and we can offer a, a bunch of unique styles, you know, coming from, from Durbanville, from Constantia uh, to Durbanville to Darling, to Cape Points um, along the coast down to 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 Elam. Um, everybody unique in their own way, but both exceptional. All of them very exceptional um, wines. And I think I think we learned to be ourselves a little bit. And I really really think that in at the moment and in the future there is a huge demand for that. And um, I truly believe that the South African Sauvignon Blanc is. Not only it, it, it was, and it is, and it will be the biggest growing category for South Africa in the future. Well, I suppose, but those, those varying styles can both be a, a blessing and a curse. We, we, we spoke about brand Marlborough, and you know, that sort of explosive tropical passion fruit, elderflower, and with pyrazines in there as well, that, that Marlborough made famous. Now that's just one style, whereas, as you've said, we've got a number of different expressions that, that South Africans but, can do so perhaps there's a, there's a branding exercise in there but no, no. i i think what made new zealand and marlborough famous might come back and kick them and that is that is where um and and maybe maybe this phrase is not 
entirely correct, but it it seems that and, and I think there's a big movement in Marlboro as well, you know, if you if you chat to the guys from Love Block and 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 etc. that they, they are also they don't want to be known as a one trick pony, sure. To put it bluntly. Um, so I think there is a movement to that. Um, I think if you go, uh, and, and, and I think that is where the big growth for South Africa can be. And I think, um, I think New Zealand is also trying to get out of that groove where New Zealand, Sauvignon Blanc, if you spot anything in a glass, you, it is very easy to, to spot that it is New Zealand. And uh, I think um, it can also be tiring sometimes. Sure, sure. Well, I mean, and I think when we also talk about styles of Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, as wine lovers, I mean, we're, we're a romantic bunch, right? And, and we, we do want to believe that actually this is just each region produces its own little bit of magic and that actually terroir is the author of all sensory joy, sure. And, and that's a lovely story. But I mean, I think we can acknowledge that perhaps the truth is a little more manufactured. And I think you hinted at it without going that far talking about Marlborough. Um, so I wanted to ask Charles now if he can talk a little bit. Uh, I mean, Charles, you've been making Sauvignon Blanc for roughly 30 years. Uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if you can share with us your thoughts on, an, on another uh, factor that drives change, and that is consumer trends. I mean, we've seen them unfolding in South Africa, and we've seen how they've affected seller practices and vineyard practices. Can you just outline what you've experienced over the last three decades? Yeah, Jonathan, thanks a lot. It's, it's really a privilege chatting to you guys. And I just want to add on to Aria. Um, we talk on a regular basis about different things, but just maybe one or two interesting facts on the history. And I'm just taking you back a little bit. So you spoke about 1880 at, at Bosch and Hebel. That's today, Kruid Constantia. Apparently, the first Sauvignon Blancs was made there. But the first written record of Sauvignon Blanc, can you believe it, was in 1943. Uh, in a, in a so, sort of a certification, I, I doubt if there was serious certification then, but by, can you believe it, from a winery in Paul called Simons Flay, and the guy there in the Second World War was Saurel or so, and he, and according to record in South Africa, that was the first written down record that Sauvignon Blanc was crushed today or made today or something like that. But it's fascinating to think it's the fourth most planted variety in South Africa, followed by Chenin Blanc, Colombar, Cabernet Sauvignon, and then Sauvignon Blanc, over 10,000 hectares. It's more than 10% of our plantings, keeping in mind in South Africa, currently there's 92,000 hectares planted all over South Africa. And I always make this statement, and it's fascinating to know that South Africa is 1.5 million square kilometers. And if you Look at take 92,000 hectares in relationship uh, to the total surface of South Africa, only 0.008% of the surface of South Africa is covered under vines. And you know, looking at the job creation of 260,000 people, 529 wineries, and I can carry on for another half an hour. But you know, John, if you if you really think, and I always look for the history, I'm sorry, Ari, I'm take, go, taking it a bit back. Who was the father of Sauvignon Blanc? You can probably say uh, Cyril Rousseau, but I don't think anybody will blame me or point the finger to me to say he was really not the father. According to me, the father of Sauvignon Blanc in South Africa, and I was privileged to rub a bit of shoulder with him, was um, um, the man from Klein Constantia that sadly passed away, that later on moved to Ross Gower. And Ross produced two wines, and for maybe people that's, uh, that's been in wine for a while, uh, not like you, Alexander, and Aria, that only have three or four years now in the industry. No, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, Ross Gower, Ross Gower um, he produced wines in 1985 and 86, Klein Constantia Savion Blanc, my friend. It was probably one of the best wines I ever tasted in this country, both 85 and 86. And I spoke to Ross, I took, I took, got in my car and I drove to him and he told me amazing stories about Sauvignon Blanc that he will send his, his picking team through literally two weeks before picking and they drop all the, the rotten berries and rotten clusters and eventually, you know, by instead of harvesting nine tons a hectare, he harvests six tons or seven tons a hectare. And, and according to me, he was the father of Sauvignon Blanc. But you spoke about styles and it's fascinating, Jono, in my opinion, and I, 
I, I, I keep on you going back to this five styles and I, please, I don't wanna, to the people that's taking this, that's a part of this webinar, I don't wanna confuse them with the high profile names, but for me, the five styles of Sauvignon Blanc is Estes, and there's wine, there's, uh, there's vineyards in South Africa that grow in, in slightly warmer regions. And esters is basically created due to the fermentation process. And don't underestimate the 962 winemakers in South Africa, because like Aria mentioned, they're resilient, they, they, they're competitive, they like to share, or there's great camaraderie. So if I produce a great wine, I want to get in my vehicle and drive through to Kleiner's also and show it to Alexander and to um, and to Aria and to Karin and to whoever is interested in that. So we, we live in an amazing country where we can share information. It's not, you know, that I want to keep everything to myself. So the first slide is Estes. Unfortunately, we can't analyze that in South Africa. In my opinion, it's flavors like pears, uh, apples, um, uh, um, jasmine, fruity flavors. You can call it whatever you want. Unfortunately, these flavors are very volatile and within eight months, after bottling, depending on the oxygen involved, that flavors are gone. The second one is thiols, and Karin is the expert on that. Thiols is tropical flavors. If you generalize that, that's blackcurrant, citrus, and grenadella, um, passion fruit. The third one is methoxyperazines, and like IDMP, I'm not a great word, fan of the word grassy. For me, it's uh, green and, and yellow asparagus, it's lemongrass, it's uh, capsicum flavors like that. That's the most stable component in a white wine that, or for that matter, in a wine you can get, even if the wine is 10 or 15 years old, that IBMP expressed in nanograms per liter is still prominent in the wine where the fowls and the, and the esters completely disappear. So uh, it's a fact that after, if you analyze a, a very tropical wine in the file style and let's say your three MHA is let's say 500 just for the afternoon is 500 a year later that's completely gone that all is uh, so volatile it evaporate or bound or, or oxidize in the bottle where the IBMP is very stable I'm a huge fan of greener flavors in Sauvignon Blanc of course not everybody share my passion for that the fourth style is wooded Sauvignon Blanc what the Americans refer to as Blanc Fumé and of course, the fifth style is natural Sauvignon Blanc, and Anuska will probably focus on that from organic, biodynamic, not just vineyards, but also winemaking, where the wines tend to be slightly different in color, slightly more phenolic, that have a very interesting wine, a, a sort of mouthfeel, but it's maybe not as prominent and upfront as the Sauvignon Blancs that we, um, we are used to. But, you know, people ask me about Charles, why is there more than 2.4 million cases of 12 Sauvignon Blanc sold a year in South Africa. Just keeping in mind, John, there's over 7 million cases produced of 12 in South Africa. And according to Salva's records, and I think you touch on it or Aria touch on it, around 2.2 million cases is export and 2.4 million cases of 12 is consumed on the local market. And you will quickly tell me it's not adding up to 7. The rest is sold in bulk or blended. It's, it's fascinating. and. Um, if you look at prices of grapes, it's fascinating. Bulk wine and grape prices, Sauvignon Blanc is really tops there. It receives year on year the best bulk prices and the best uh, you know, cost per ton, as simple as that. So we talk about the five different styles. Uh, um, and But people ask me, you know, I was last week in Bed Bank. I'm not as privileged to be in Stellenbosch where they sold the whole crop through the tasting room. I must travel to different destinations and sell wine there. So I was in Wittbank and whenever I praise Sauvignon Blanc, people will say, Charles, but why is it so popular in South Africa? And I think we, each of us will have a different answer to that. But I think we love to be outside. You know, we, we live in a hot country. We must accept that. We love to be outside. South Africans, in my opinion, love to, and I think we all are part of that, love to barbecue and have picnics and go for a walk on the beach. And, you know, and Sauvignon Blanc is just perfect for that. But John, I, 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 I asked Nicolette to I send a free slides and I want to take you through that and maybe just explain to you how, how Sauvignon Blanc, the vinification of Sauvignon Blanc have changed in the last, let's say, in my 34 years. It's amazing. Nicolette, if you can put that on for me, the third slide, the third one, please, if you don't mind. No, you, can, you can go to the third one, please, if it's possible. 
There we go. I hope that makes sense to the to the listeners or the people taking part. You know, years ago when I started off, uh, just use your imagination. You receive a load of Savion Blanc in turns or a, or a gondola or in kisses. You do whatever you want. You give it skin contact and look just, and then it's settled. You treat it with the enzyme. If that is your style with a dash of sulfur, then it's settled in a cold tank and all the solids flock to the bottom and the solid looks like the, 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 the fourth uh, smaller bottle on the side that you can see is the solids. It's sort of very thick and it's of course deeper in color. But when I started off um, years ago, the trick was to um, draw the juice as clear as possible from the solids. And there you can see a classic example there is the control, clear juice after 48 hours of settling the NTUs, I asked Corinne, what does NTU stand for? I'm supposed to know, but it's just a measurement of clarity. Uh, if you so a simple, if you if you make it simple, but guys, that is free uh, um, NTUs. That's like a filter juice. It's 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 really clear, clear, clear. And years ago, that will immediately be inoculated. The temperature will be increased to let's say if it's below 10 to above 10, and you will inoculate, and the process will start. And then over time, French consultants visit South Africa, young winemakers travel abroad. They went to New Zealand and France and California. I went to California and France and I came back and I say, but listen here, let's add a bit of the fourth bottle, the solids, specifically the cloud on top, add that back to the clear juice. And there you can see um, we add half a percentage of solids in the clear juice and mix it. And uh, by, just by coincidence, it's very difficult to determine exactly that. But there you can see the NTUs is 50 nanograms per liter. And then the third bottle is uh, one, one percentage of solids added to the juice. And there the, the NTU is 100. So it's amazing. Uh, um, Jono, years ago, our Savia Blancs were fruity, was expressive, but they did not have the mouthfeel. And I love the word viscosity. The viscosity and over time by playing around just this simple thing adding a bit of the solids back into your tank before you inoculate and before you make any additions there you can see how we can manipulate today i do all the fermentation at the crandall uh, between 80 and 100 nanograms there you can see like in the third bottle you must be a bit aware after fermentation that you check your lease regularly that you don't have an off odor that can you that can have a negative effect on your full tank because that's that wine for that matter, that uh, fermented wine or must is full of solids, you know, and, and uh, I hope this makes sense. I hope this makes sense. And, and it's just amazing over time how much flesh and how much meat, if I may use that word, how much viscosity we could build in our wines. And, uh, you know, I spoke about the five different styles, ester styles, uh, methoxyperazines, wooded and so-called natural wines. And of course, the trick is not to specialize in one style, but to build as many styles as possible and make your wine as complex as possible. And uh, I don't know who's going to talk about areas, but you know, the areas in a big way will determine what style of wine you produce. And uh, I know areas say the most plantings is in, is in Robertson and in Stellenbosch, but there's amazing vineyards in Darling, and if you understand the influence of Darling, if you look at the success of the top 10 Sauvignon Blancs a few years ago, I, um, um, I, was, a, I was a bit involved in the top 10 and somebody asked me to present a tasting of the top 10 wines and I went back to the origin of fruit and it was fascinating. Seven of that top 10 wines, I think it was about uh, maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, was uh, had a, a, a substantial percentage of darling fruit in it. And today it's so amazing that the focus have moved a bit away from darling. And now there's amazing vineyards in Elgin and in Ilham and in Rawsonville. And you know how people in Rawsonville can, can understand. And even in Robertson, for that matter, um, Fredendal, uh, and even a year or two ago, very successful wines in the, uh, in the Orange River. So winemakers that's motivated and want to produce a unique style of Sauvignon Blanc understand the limitations of their climatic conditions and their soils and their yields. And they pick the fruit at different stages and they uh, must enrich the juice. It's all legal and produce amazing wine. So this is a, a, a huge uh, slap on the back. I'm not slap on the back, pat on the back to say um, 
uh, how competitive and resilient South African winemakers is. You know, they're not all saying, oh, I can't produce a great Sauvignon Blanc because it's too hot or too this or too that. They go out and they try different things and it's amazing, absolutely amazing. So Nicolette, if you can just go, I just want to show you, um, Jonah, two other slides that's maybe interesting. Uh, Nicolette, if you can show that first slide again. Um, there we go. That, uh, that uh, is just a, a cluster, a Sauvignon Blanc cluster. I think you will agree with me. I call it the dynamics of a Sauvignon Blanc cluster. You will see bigger berries, smaller ones, even one or two small. And it's not rot, guys. It's raisins here at the back where the biggest berries just squeeze off the others and that dry over the ripening stage. And then if we put it through the crusher, and we, um, I know there's some people that probably press whole clusters. I'm a great fan of skin contact. I told you I'm a big fan of... Um, um, of metoxyperazines. So if you look at the smaller berries at A, about 20%, I'll show you now the next slide also, but 20% um, of, the, of the berries go whole through the whole process of destalking. No, Nicolette, go back to the first one still, please. There we go. 20% uh, of the berries will go whole through the whole system, uh, the crushing process. And then at C, you will see the bigger berries is completely uh, how do you say, John? Tear or torn? Tear open of uh, open up? Yeah, torn open. Torn. That's torn open. Of course, the big risk is that the beater of your crusher can hit the seed inside. So a berry like that will have anything from two to four seeds in it. And of course, as soon as the seed is damaged, then your um, wine can be a bit phenolic and a bit hard. So the ideal is to just torn the berry open like in B to open it up for some juice to be released. And Nicolette, if you can now go to, to picture two, please. You will see there, one of my students, I asked her to take a, 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 a sort of a jug full of berries underneath the crusher. That's now destalked and rolled. So the berry is supposed to be crushed. And there you can see different variations. I don't know, guys, if, if, if you can see my arrow here. There, for instance, is a whole berry. There's one that's, John, can you see it or not? No, I can't see that right. Okay, but if you if you look at the at the row here at the third the, the on, on my right hand side you will see the the second and third berry is completely whole and uh, completely uh, intact in place. The fourth berry is just open up and look at the fifth berry there. The whole berry is damaged and of course that will be a big soft berry on the outside. And if you can uh, sort of look at this and we'll work on a ratio of 60-20-20. Um, then I will go back to my crusher and adjust that. And can you believe it? It's nothing to say. It's all about the speed of destalking. And that will determine how much berries is ideally open on top and completely damaged or will go whole through the whole system. Of course, you don't want more than 20% whole berries because there's, then there's no real um, advantage of giving it skin contact. You understand? And just a, uh, another third, third thing, and then I'm going to end off by talking about the, 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 the vessel to give skin contact in years ago, it was the old scale, you know, the separator with huge lids on top and it was impossible to seal it off. So it was quite an oxidative process. And nowadays we protect the, 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 the mass or the destore grapes with a bit of dry house, dry ice, um, sometimes with a dash of salt, of course, uh, most of the time with a dash of sulfur and our vessels or our container can close up completely and it's and it's mounted, it's fitted with a very effective cooling. So uh, in some cases, I do experiments by giving Sauvignon Blanc up to 18 hours skin contact and then only press it. So it's a bit of logistics going in there, but it's fascinating to see the effect of skin contact. So John, that was quite a mouthful, but that's my story. I hope it makes sense. I hope it didn't confuse the uh, maybe non-winemakers. But uh, that was just uh, uh, one or two interesting things. I can keep you busy, my friend, till 11 <laughs> o'clock tonight. So let's finish off here and uh, okay. hand over to Anushka and the doctor. They will talk through the rest of the, of the yeah. chemical side. Can I just ask one more question on the things that you've mentioned? Um, you obviously talked about the increasing NTU levels creating mouthfeel. What is the danger? Because Obviously, everything comes, you know, for every bonus, there's a sacrifice. There's always two sides to the coin. So if you increase your NTUs too much, what are the potential pitfalls for winemakers? 
Now, the wine will have a completely different aromatics. You know, if you go to NTUs, and that's my personal opinion, maybe Karim can differ from me, but uh, Jono, if you go to NTUs well above 120, I know there's Shinnens and Chardonnays fermented at that, but I think then there's a risk that the wine can be slightly phenolic and you must be really, really alert to off odors because you can imagine this stuff that you separate now, then you rack the clear juice, you add quite a big portion of this back and then there's a risk. I'm telling you, my friend, you must one day take a tank of Sauvignon Blanc. I tried it a few times by just pressing it a small tank and fermenting it, you know, with, with NTUs of probably three, four hundred. I'm telling you, you will fall off your chair to smell that and taste that. It's 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 amazing. It's like fermenting that on the skins. And that's what the probably I'm referring to the fifth style. And that is the natural wine. So there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a complete different wine, if I may use that term. And Anuska will be the expert on that. So that's my story. I hope it made sense. Thank you so much, Charles. I suppose, I suppose that last comment you made about how much skins can change the nature of a wine is a whole nother conversation about how we talk about terroir when something like skins can change a wine so much, even though it's from the same vineyard. But I think that's for another day. So uh, Karin, this does feel like uh, the perfect time to bring you into the conversation. And for those of you who at home, you might not know, Karin completed her doctoral dissertation on the effect of oxidation and aging on Sauvignon Blanc's uh, chemical and sensory composition. She also has a special interest in the effect of winemaking practices on Sauvignon Blanc's wine quality. So in light of this background, Green, um, I wanted to find out, we talked a little bit, Charles talked about sealing vessels and, and how, how it's now easier to protect grapes uh, and, and how just the vessels in general have got better, but what have been some of the technological advancements in the cellar that you feel have impacted quality of Sauvignon Blanc over the last 20 years? Well, Jono, the thing is, I think before we head over to the cellar, I think just coming from a research background and having work in the laboratory is that, um, that we were now able to actually measure these very uh, aromatic and potent compounds that are present in nanogram per liter concentrations in the wines. So it was not long ago that we were only able to, well, firstly identify things like methoxypyrazines and the volatiles, and then also now to quantify it. And in research circles, that really opened up a lot um, in terms of we were able to start doing projects to look at different winemaking practices, different new technology, um, and see what the effect is on, especially Sauvignon Blanc and uh, quality and aroma. But then, uh, and practices to see how to maximize it and how to get the, the potential extraction and how to, um, you know, get the best production of, of obviously of what you want. But then, like Charles also said, things like skin contact obviously can have a major effect and then oxygen exposure also. It's just recent things that we were able now to really test and do trials on and see what, what is the effect. But when it comes to technological advancements, I think one of the main things would have to be um, yeast strains. So uh, yeast strains differ enormously in their potential to number one, release volatile thals from precursors, to form volatile thals from not only from precursors, but also inherently almost, and then also to convert volatile thals, but also other compounds from, from one aromatic compound to another, um, and thereby changing the aromatic profile. So yeast really plays an enormous role in, in terms of Sauvignon Blanc aroma. So you can really change your wine style just with that. And I think um, the options at the moment is, is quite extensive, and there's a lot of different yeast styles on the market that you can play around with. But then secondly, I think we have now come to understood, uh, maybe a while ago already started to understand the stability of these Sauvignon Blanc compounds. And that kind of flowed over to the cellar in, in winemaking and um, preservation techniques. But I think one of the main thing would be the closure types and oxygen ingress, because we know now that volatile thiols, like, like Charles also said, you know, 3MHA is very sensitive to natural hydrolysis and to oxidation. So basically it'll just break down it doesn't even need oxygen, but it'll break down faster with oxygen, but naturally it will also start to break down over time. 
And things like closure types will have a massive effect, you know, as we all know, screw caps will let in um, less oxygen than the, the corks and different cork types, they also um, differ. So definitely there with the closure types and oxygen ingress, I think with that technological advancements and um, yeah, the, 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 the role that screw caps started to play in, in wine closures, um, it's, it's quite a big technological advancement for, for especially for Sauvignon Blanc, which has those sensitive aromas. But then also on that stability, you know, things like reductive presses where the grapes are not exposed to air, but rather to nitrogen while it is being pressed, while that balloon is inflated and deflated. Uh, different types of antioxidants. We're still testing this all the time um, to see the effects of that. And uh, storage conditions. I think that is something we, we've known for a while is different storage conditions, but now that we can actually test the compounds, we really see this, the effect of different storage conditions. Then quite recently also um, like the Dimostal, the freezing of the juice, and that was also quite a, new, a novel um, winemaking method. And they obviously have enormous success with that. Um, quite an interesting technique to use. We're still not exactly sure what the mechanism involved is in freezing the juice, but we definitely, I mean, we've done trials where you do a control um, and compare it with the treatment and, and the effect is really is quite pronounced. And then lastly, it would be something like the Nutrifem X, which I think is a bit um, a controversial um, subject, but it's a yeast nutrient and it can have quite a big effect on the aromatics of a wine, um, especially of Sauvignon Blanc. So yeah, they, there's just a few of the, the more recent advancements in, in the industry. I mean, the, the yeast strain thing is something that fascinates me and that I, I'm wanting to understand, obviously these yeast work more effectively or more efficiently with precursors that then develop into um, volatile thiols on the other side of fermentation. My question is, have we got to the point where yeast strains can actually create flavors that would never have existed at all in that wine? Or is it more a case of putting a magnifying glass over certain elements? I mean, how far have, has the development gotten with these, these super strains? Um, I haven't really come across where a yeast strain is able to produce something completely new without the building blocks being present in the juice. I don't always want to say precursors because you can get quite general compounds um, or molecules that can almost merge or combine with another pretty common molecule and then produce something. So, um, yeah, I'd rather say, you know, that, that yeast really, they have to use certain building blocks to be able to, to make aromatic compounds, but then also to take precursors, which they then basically, a precursor would be a compound that they take and they break a piece off and the rest would be aromatic. So, but other than that, I haven't really seen anything that the, that the yeast is able to completely produce something entirely new. Okay. Well, so just moving on a little, I was going through some presentations by Johan Furi, who's now at Benguela Cove. Uh, he was at KWB at the time, and he was talking about Sauvignon Blancs from Elam, Darling, Butleray Hills. Uh, in this presentation, he was talking about how pyrazine-driven green pepper, tin pea, nettle expressions of Sauvignon Blanc uh, lend themselves better to aging. I, I assume then then say the thiol-driven styles. And I know Charles touched on the fact that these volatiles actually disappear very quickly. And I assume that is why the, the thiol-driven styles don't age as well. But then you, you talked about um, how screw caps have started to make an impact. Uh, are we able to see thiols preserved better? Are these styles starting to age better now that we have a better technology in the production of screw caps or closures or anything like that? Or is it still a case of, if you wanna make a Sauvignon Blanc that's gonna age well, you have to lean into the pyrazine style? Jonna, that's an interesting question. Um, well, firstly, I just want to address one part of your question, and that would be the effect of the screw cap on the thiols. I think there's still a very big component of where the thiols are subject to hydrolysis or to breakdown. Um, 
irrespective of the type of closure or the oxygen ingress. So you will start to see degradation of the thiols without it being oxidized. And things like temperature, we've seen temperature has got a massive influence on that. Um, you know, the lower the temperature, the more you preserve it quite um, substantially. And then also mm -hmm. this- uh, Fermentation yes. temperature or storage temperature? Storage temperature, yeah. Okay. Um, and then uh, other factors like the pH of the wine can also have an influence, but temperature is really a massive factor that can play a role there. Um, and then just about the, the aging of, of Sauvignon Blanc and the, the styles that go well with aging is Charles uh, touched on that quite a bit, but just to, to echo what he said, and that would be that the volatile piles, like I said, is quite sensitive to breakdown or to oxidation. So they tend to go away first. And what you're left over with is the methoxypyrazines, which are quite stable compounds that don't really change during winemaking. You can extract a little bit more um, during grape processing, but it's not going to really change after that. Uh, but I think another thing that we need to keep in mind is that we often see that the wines with fuller body and, um, you know, not heavier, but let's say full bodied wines tend to age better than a bit, maybe perhaps a bit more leaner wines. And pyrazine levels are higher. Um, or let's rather put it like this, the pyrazine levels would decline uh, during ripening. So the closer you get to harvest, your, your concentrations will decline. So what I'm trying to say is, if you want more pyrazines, uh, you tend to want to look at harvesting a little bit earlier with the risk of getting a wine that's a bit more leaner, almost on the palate, because you don't have that... Um, ripeness almost on the palate. So what I'm getting at is that if you go for the pyrazine style to be able to get that optimal aging, you have to be careful for not uh, exchanging that and then, you know, ending up with um, a wine that is too lean, almost watery and, and high in acidity and unbalanced. So because those wines also, even though they can initially be uh, perhaps be more balanced, they won't age well because as soon as the fruit is gone, you're left with the green and an unbalanced acidity. But yes, in general, if you get this beautiful, beautifully balanced, full bodied wine with beautiful green aromatics, capsicum um, and asparagus, they do age well and they will age better will likely age better than a wine that is file driven. Great, thank you. Now, Karina, you obviously spend a lot of time on the international panel for the Concours Mundial Sauvignon, which is a, a global competition for the best Sauvignon Blanc around the planet. And we've talked a lot about how different regions produce completely different styles. So I wonder when, when you guys meet as a panel, is there some sort of gold standard region that the, the panel just understands this is what everyone should be aiming for. I mean, how do you go about pitting these various styles against one another? Um, like, I don't believe there really is a gold standard. And if you look at the panel, number one, the panel is quite large. And then it's people from all over the world. And everybody's got very specific ideas on, and preferences of what should be, um, you know, the award-winning wines. And then also, if you look at the, at the winning wines each year, the wines that win the, not the gold medal, but the, the, that come out tops in the competition, they also tend to differ and are diverse in, in wine styles. So, um, yeah, I believe that the panel in general, they are, you know, looking for a wine that is, balanced with all the elements that are in perfect harmony and while still showing concentration and, and personality. But in terms of looking for one specific style, I don't believe that that is how they approach it, or at least that's not how I approach it. And, and from my colleagues that I was on panels with definitely did not approach it that way. Because I think sometimes in, in, the, in the mind of the average wine lover, there's the sense that judges are immune to trends. But I mean, Judges are human as well. And we, we talked about how there was a time when the South African public loved these green, explosive, pyrazine-driven wines, and then New Zealand did its thing, and then thiols were, were in, and now you wanted loads of tropical fruit, and it feels like we're still in that space a little bit. 
where people want loads of tropical fruit. Do these judging panels, I mean, have you noticed a similar sort of thing where actually the conversation is shifts towards a certain theme? Um, and I guess the reason I'm asking is because South Africans, South African winemakers locally are looking to position themselves well. I mean, goodness, how do you even go about doing that? But you know, do, do panels shift in the same way that consumer trends have shifted? I think that's what I'm trying to ask. I would like to think that the panel is, um, is not subject to that um, type of variation. But I would agree with you that, I mean, uh, but it's the same type of debate in terms of your preference also playing a role, your own personal preference, and not only consumer trends, but what you like, what you don't like, and how that can spill over in, into um, a judging process. But I mean, as a judge, you need to try and stay as objective as you can and look for, again, for that balance and harmony. And um, But I do think there must be some, some sort of influence. But Perhaps uh, you know you need to trust that the panel will will look at things objectively. But also, Jonna, just to get back to what you said earlier in terms of uh, trends that certain panelists go out for, and, and that is maybe something that I've seen, and that would be that if people from different countries obviously uh, are used to different tastes, have different palates, and that's a, a lot of the time that is a trend that I can pick up when I'm on a panel is that certain wines that I don't enjoy, there's always the one panelist that really loves it. And I can always, you can almost start to see the trend of when you when the wines are revealed, because you do get the sheet afterwards to see. And you always you can almost see the trend of mostly, most of the times that wine would be from that person's country. It's because we're used to that. I, I enjoy the South African wines. That's what I'm used to. I believe it's some of the best in the world. So, um, but I, yeah, so I do think that, you know, some of that personal preference can come in and influence you in a certain way. But then again, that is why a, a competition like concourse have such a large panel with a variety of uh, judges from different countries and regions. Great. Thanks, Karine. Well, we've, we've spent quite a lot of time talking about... Uh, in the John, land. I think Charles has a question. Charles, Charles speak. Tell, tell us what you have to say. You're on mute still, Charles. Annette, can we unmute Charles? Or you can press the space bar and talk. There we go. No, John, just something we, we, we spoke about New Zealand and, and, uh, and, and sorry, Karine, this is now slightly away from your um, technical side and judging internationally. You know, one of, one of our biggest challenges in South Africa is volumes of Sauvignon Blanc. We spoke and it sounds like we are a, a big producer of Sauvignon Blanc, but we don't have brands that is 50,000 top quality. That's a great expression of an area or a winemaker's philosophy. That's 50,000 cases plus. And that's the big advantage of New Zealand. If you look at Love Block and uh, Hunters and, and, and you know the big names there, they all floating, I went there and I, um, with Karin and, and, and Tace and, and uh, a few other guys, and we spent a bit of time in New Zealand. And their big advantage is one flat valley mulberry. And I say this in respect, and I, I sort of envy them. Uh, and their wines are, uh, Aria touched on that, that, he was saying that maybe they're all the same or it will bite them in the, in the, in the leg in the future. But you know, the great thing is, you can't conquer the world with 5,000 cases or 10,000 cases. And, you know, we, the Grendel, is sitting in a position like that. We produce 17,000 cases of Sauvignon Blanc, and it sounds amazing, but it's not big enough. If you want to be a big role player in Europe or in America, you need 50,000 cases. And this, except maybe the big boys like the Stell and Dermondal Hills and maybe Dimas Dahl that have, so, uh, uh, the toys group have big volumes, but that's one of our biggest challenges. We, uh, most of us spoke about world-class wines, but you know, who in the world do you impress if you produce two or 5,000 cases? You know, you want, you want to be a big player in the world. If you want to be a big dog, you need to have volumes behind you of top quality. And that's what we lack. Sorry, Karim, this is now slightly away from your talk. I, it just upset me. And I need to say that. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> just, just a quick um, question on that. Because I always want to be practical with these conversations. And 
you know, what is the, what is the answer to solving that problem? Because estates can't just double their production. Uh, and I, I know that, you know, Burgundy has a, has a similar problem in that there are small little plots and thousands of producers, and yet they somehow manage to, and I suppose partially through the use of negotiants, produce large volume brands. So, so you know, how, do you think that that can be done at the highest quality level for Sauvignon Blanc producers in South Africa, Charles? Uh, you know, if, if you look at our size, we have 529 wineries in South Africa. And there's more than the, the John Platter taste a year ago, more than 8,000 SKUs, certified SKUs. And then if you divide that into that, you will, you will quickly do a calculation to work out that each winery have 15 SKUs, 15 labels. And that's one of our biggest shortfalls in this country. I don't care what any person say, my friend, that is. If you go to New Zealand, ask Karim, we went there, a winery will have a Sauvignon Blanc, a Pinot Gris, and maybe a Weisser Riesling, and maybe a red wine, an odd red blend. Where we go, you know, and I'm, I'm not pointing fingers, we at the Grendel is part of that. We have 14 different SKUs, and that's yeah. our big shortfall. We, how do you say, we uh, cut our, you know, we dilute our the marketing. We all need to have three or four SKUs, three or four focus labels. Uh, that will be our success. And, and, you know, here is the biggest culprit talking to you now. Uh, and, and, you know, this is one of our shortfalls. In the real world, we need to have a value with one amazing Sauvignon Blanc from Darling that is 200,000 cases and that kick ass. And all of us, if we walk into a restaurant, we want to say, bring us that Sauvignon Blanc. That is a true expression of a South Africa. Now we have 8,000 labels. Of course, not all of that is Sauvignon Blanc, but that's in South Africa for me, one of our biggest single shortfalls. But I have enough to say now, Jonah. I'm going to stop talking. I, and Karina, I'm sorry, I I'll, I'll send you a WhatsApp. I'm sorry I interrupt you. No, it's <laughs> Charles. I mean, I, I think the, these, are, these are important conversations. I mean, you're talking both about, about focus and about quantity, and neither of those things are things that can be changed overnight. But the idea here is that, that winemakers can listen to the issues and ask themselves how they can overcome it. But if we're going to just keep the, to keep the conversation rolling forward, we have been spending a lot of time talking about in the cellar. Karin, you talked about so in the lab about how certain techniques and styles can have changed the expression of Sauvignon Blanc over the years. And, and I know it almost feels like we've taken a deconstructionist approach to Sauvignon Blanc a little bit, um, which I think was super helpful. But one of the mantras that moves around in wine circles in heavy rotations that wine is made in the vineyard. Now, Obviously, we talked about these super yeasts like VIN7 or VIN13 or the Inartus uh, Nutrafirm, which boost styles by up to 500%. One has to wonder how much of what we drink is attributed to terroir and how much is attributed to things like yeast. But when we move to that category, Charles, that you mentioned, category number five of biodynamic and spontaneously or native fermented Sauvignon Blanc, that conundrum about where is the, where those flavors come from, it completely falls away. So that's why I thought it's so important, Nushka, to have you on the panel, because given that Reinecke is a biodynamic certified estate, there can be no flavor modulation of wine, at least through the addition of things like nitrogen or enzymes or yeast nutrition or specialized yeast strains. So it feels like you guys have, in a, in a positive way, possibly painted yourself into a corner that you must be focusing on viticulture. So I wanted to ask you, because we have talked about how trends change, have you found in the vineyards, pruning techniques or canopy managed techniques on Reinecke have had to shift to try and create the sorts of wines that consumer trends demand? Or does that very question insult you to your core? <laughs> um, well, let's just say I don't think at any point Reinecke has ever tried to make a wine that is... Um, try to focus on the consumer. Um, I think Johan Reinecke is the original hipster uh, when it comes to doing something completely different. Uh, so, so yeah, I think, like you said, to be certified biodynamic, there's no, it literally just has to be the purest form of the wine. And therefore it's showcasing what the vineyards can give us. Uh, we have different blocks and we have different parcels in the blocks that we ferment differently. Uh, it all is 
kept separate and then we'll kind of relook at it afterwards um, and batch test as we go through hot, like harvest and then later on once ferments have all kind of chilled and we have the time again um, and we make notes and we work through it so we'll see you know like in a certain block there's more um, thiol driven we'll look at a certain box where there's more pyrazine driven characteristics and we can look at that and see if it, like it works in the style that we're trying to make and uh, we can adjust certain certain things but in essence our biggest focus is just actually making sure that our vineyards and our soils are healthy and actually producing the grapes that like that we do like the biggest thing is really for me just to actually nurture the grapes that come off these vines and try and make great wines from the grapes so I don't think at any point we try and over manipulate anything. I think the biggest thing is that we there is no over manipulation. It's more about soil health and vineyard health. Um, obviously, I think the manipulations where it comes in for us is like if we see on a certain block, there might be a little more rot. You know, is the canopy overly, um, you know, vigorous? Is it a little more to green? Is it in an area where you know, at least wind or that type of thing. So then we'll adjust it like that. So we'll adjust for um, faults, if I can say it, but not really faults, but just to try and get the best and the cleanest and uh, fruit to be able to make the best wine. So I think that is that is really one of one of the biggest things. I don't know if that makes sense. No, really. no totally answer the question. I think maybe what I had in mind is um, listening to some of the guys from um, Durbanville, for example, talk about how at some stage they used to let the canopy be a little more vigorous in order to preserve or to, to slow ripening. And then as far as they were concerned, consumer uh, demands changed. And so they started to open up the fruit zone a lot more to let a lot more sun onto the fruit, uh, which enabled riper flavors, but may have wreaked havoc with acidity levels. So, so I was more wondering yeah. if you guys experienced that, or even do you find, okay, certain blocks present a certain character. So we're going to prune in a certain way to preserve that or, I'm always yeah, so I think, like I said, we do, we keep different blocks in different sections in the box se separately. It is, I mean, manipulation, and we're all farming, it's very easy to manipulate to get certain char characters. But, you know, like if you over fertilize and you are going to have a bigger, greener canopy, you're going to have over vigorous, you know, over vigorous vines, you're going to have certain characteristics with that. So I think truly it's trying to get balance into your vineyards to try and get that. But manipulation in any sorts you know be it in the cellar or in the vineyard you can do all of that um i think in Reineke we try and not do that we try and get the balance right um get a good healthy crop um i think that's always the biggest challenge with organics and biodynamics is to actually have that so that it is financially sustainable um yeah i don't know if charles is going to take us seriously because we're definitely not producing the quantities that he was suggesting <laughs> for all of us we're not there um so you know it's um it makes a little difference if we are smaller scale than than that yes and i mean we're going to be chatting to alex a little bit more about this but what percentage of the vines on Renica are trellised and what percentage are bush vines so all the sauvignon blancs are trellised uh the vineyards are um planted in the 90s so they're over good over like over 25 they're between 25 and 28 years old at the stage. There's a new small block that's been planted, um, but that's also trellised. Yeah, okay. makes it easier for working specifically on those on those um, on those cultivars and then the blocks. I suppose in that sense, even trellising is a, is a sort of intervention, I guess. But uh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's like we also it is farming and it is biodynamic farming. You're still farming. You need to actually look at that. Not at one point is that a natural thing, you know, to trellis and do all of that. So we just try and stay away as much as chemicals and try and do it as natural as possible. Yeah. And but when I, I mean, talking about flavors, because that's really where I was coming from with these questions. When I drink the Rainica Reserve White, and similarly with with wines like um, Bartercleus Circumstance Sauvignon Blanc, which is produced along similar farming and vinification principles. It, it feels ironic to me that these wines have more in common with a region like Sancerre, perhaps, than, than they do with wines that might be produced on an estate right next door. I mean, is this, would you say this is the result of a deliberate winemaking style? I mean, what would you put this down to? 
Um, so I definitely don't think, so once again, trying to not make a specific style, um, I think our biggest thing maybe in that type of thing is not over manipulation. So not overworking, not trying to extract or not to over extract certain things. I can guarantee you that anyone in Sanse or Perfume can tell you that our wines definitely don't taste like this, right? So, <laughs> and, um, you know, and like, I think the thing is we make, we make unique wines and that is, that's all that we're trying to do. We're trying to showcase the estate. There's an interesting study that, however, that is being done, and this is where it gets a bit geeky. Um, and there's not a, it's not a full done study. It's like early on, but um, Dr. Vodia Satati and um, Dr. Florian Bauer at the university have been doing soil samples um, from us and checking microbial uh, life in the soil, and would take from neighboring farms, neighboring plots, and actually start look at the microbial life and the different microbial lives and actually chart it out. And for instance, if you look at a pie chart, there'll be over like a hundred different little, you know, pies in the, you know, in soils of ours um, in comparison to maybe the neighbors where there's four different, um, you know, square or triangles or pies, you know, in, in the pie chart. So, uh, um, you know, if you're looking at that automatically and even in blocks that are like, very different to us so we'll have one block that's literally or it's kind of next to the, the one or it's just a pocket in the other one there'll be complete different microbial life in, um, in that specific section in comparison to another so if you want to start looking into that there's quite a lot of um, interest and it's interesting to see the characteristical difference that you get in the juice um, from that you know and if we start looking at what our gut bacteria does for us and how we react to that, you know, that's like, that's one thing. But so if you think of that, microbial life is so vital in any plant or actually, you know, making um, in grapes and the development of grapes and flavors, it's kind of an interesting thought. So there's no concrete facts, nothing is like, it's, it's an ongoing study that's starting to go, you know, carry on with that. But it's interesting to maybe think that microbial diversity if you're farming this way where there's a live soil that maybe that's actually where a lot of characteristics or you know flavor characteristics or differences are actually starting to showcase themselves so the yeah. food for thought <laughs> it feels like it must be a nightmare to be a sommelier in this day and age i mean it used to be oh chalky limestone soils can you taste the chalk in the wine now it's like chalky limestone stores, but what is the micro, the macrobiological breakdown? Um, and I, I love the idea of the terroir as a concept or an idea has to evolve to include the biological elements. I mean, that's just, that's incredible. Anyway. Yeah, thank you. absolutely. Yeah. So I've also, I've noticed, and, and I'm, Alex, I want to bring you into the conversation. You've been, you've been very patient, but uh, we've, I've noticed winemakers and viticulturalists talk more and more about the importance of varietal clones uh, or selections and, and the roles that they play in the final uh, flavor profile of the wine. Now, Alex, you've been making wine around the world. And as, as we said earlier, you're kind of part of the fourth generation of winemakers in the Greer family. Have you noticed that Vera, the estate has changed the clones that they've been working with over the years? And, and what were the reasons for those changes, if any? But, um, yeah, uh, that's actually sort of a, uh, a weird question um, in the sense that uh, in the sense that we at Blera we haven't actually replanted um, in the last couple of years. Um, we've actually more adapted uh, in changing our pruning methods to increase the longevity of the vines we already have um, in the soil. Um, as our farming philosophy is more in the sustainable side of farming. And with my uncle, um, Simon, who's the viticulturist, he actually just wanted to change his pruning methods and then actually, because the vines we have in the soils at this stage and back then were really delivering good quality uh, wines and grapes. And so he was looking at methods to actually increase the longevity of these vines. And there was a couple of, a couple of other factors also that played a role um, in us changing our pruning methods. So that's the route we've actually gone is just to change our, the way we pruned all our vines completely. Um, in the last um, six to 10 years. And in doing so, just to increase the longevity of these vines and actually bringing them up uh, in uniform 
quality and quantity wise um, in the whole process. Yeah. So an our main clones, um, actually that we work with on Sauvignon Blanc, um, which is also our, our bush farm block. And we've actually grafted some of that as is the old uh, Beer Stasi clone, uh, weather station clone. And um, for us, that clone on our swirls and where we situated actually works the best for us and gives us really a lot of pyrazine characters. And sort of, we also, same as Charles, we, on our Sauvignon Blanc, especially our reserve, we enjoy a bit more of that pyrazine green character um, um, in our wines, yeah. So, I mean, I was just reading through some of the, the content, this content that you guys have on your website about Villiera Sauvignon Blanc and, and you keep, well, the, your, your copywriters. I use phrases like keeping up with the trends or embracing this new style or in employing new trends in winemaking. I, I think trend is a big thing for Sauvignon Blanc. I'd love you to try and just talk a little bit about what are some of those changes that you've made to embrace the new styles? How have they impacted uh, Villera's wines? Oh, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's more not, it's more the whole winemaking team. Um, sort of from, because 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 at Valero we focus on sustainability. So as a, as a winemaking team, we were looking how can we bring what we're doing in the vineyards, bring it back into into the cellar, sort of similar to what Nushka and them are doing at Reineke. Um So since 2018, actually we've changed. We don't inoculate any of our still wines. Uh, we do spontaneous fermentation on all the whites and the reds, and especially with the Sauvignon Blanc, um, we focused a lot on that and. We sort of we want to express terroir, but also express the different um, vintages as well. And we find over the years um, it's actually really worked out perfectly for us, and it's helped us a lot developing our own style. Um, and in saying that as well, we also look at fermenting at different temperatures. Um, we've taken the blocks, certain blocks we'll do 24 hours skin contact, six hours, eight hours, and then certain blocks will also ferment colder, and others will ferment a bit hotter to release some other files and esters in it as well. And then out of that, we'll get the different uh, blending components um, to make up all our wines, especially with the Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, we found, especially with fermenting at different temperatures, um, the end result is uh, way better compared to what it was in the past where we just used to inoculate um, in that sense. So you're saying in the past, you may have used yeast strain in order to create differentiation between parcels, but now that you're using all spontaneous fermentation, just by keeping the fermentation batches at different temperatures, you create a different bracket of flavors. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. And then each block will will each block will also keep separate and we'll do a different thing with that block. Um, over the last three years, we sort of um, in the beginning we, we had took everything and did everything exactly the same way. And then out of that, then we could see what what each block actually delivers to us. So and that with the years along, and we're still learning at this stage as well. So we'll take it block by block, keep it separate, vinify it differently, crush it differently, all of that. And then at the end, we'll look at all the best blocks and then blend it together. So it's all just part, we're still learning as we're going on, but yeah, we just want to bring that whole sustainable focus back into the cellar, into the cellar as well. Um, it's a bit more stressful, but yeah, at the end of the day, the, the results are shame. So yeah, the, like I say, the proof's in the pudding. Yeah, so. That's right. Yeah. And uh, and you, I mean, so so interestingly, your your you have a, a an old bush vine block that goes into your your oak Sauvignon Blanc release. Yes. Uh, given that conventional wisdom would suggest that Sauvignon Blanc works best when trellised, yeah. what do you feel are the unique sensory attributes that bush vine Sauvignon Blanc adds to the scene that otherwise wouldn't exist? Um, yeah, it's the <laughs> bush vine, um, sort of all our oldest blocks um, on the farm are all old bush vine blocks. Uh, most of them implanted in the 80s. Um, and especially with Sauvignon Blanc, um, we just find this old block was planted in 1984. Um, it's the Vierstasi clone, but that block's also split in half where the bottom section has, um, of the bottom section, rootstock step into the top, the bottom is Salt Creek. Um, so with the Salt Creek, you get a lot more bigger um, out of the vines and all that. And the top section is Richter 1110. So with Richter, um, the rootstock actually, you don't get as much bigger. So, so that old block, I'll also, when I pick it, I'll pick it um, different stages as well. Um, the top section, I'll pick a bit um, late. Sorry. Sorry, no, my connection cut off for a second. Uh, so, so the top section, I'll pick a bit uh, later, a bit riper. Um, with the Richter, not a lot of bigger, you get more sun penetration. 
um, even though it's uh, bush fine, because with bush fine, the grapes are closer to the soil. So your variation of temperature and all of that, the fluctuation is not as much as when you have terrace and you've got a lot more canopy. Uh, but with the rifter root stock, um, there's less leaves, less bigger, so that you get a bit more sun penetration and that gives you more your tropical notes, your tropical characters. And then with the um, Salt Creek, which you get a lot more bigger, a lot more growth, the bunches are really, you sort of have to pull the leaves apart actually to get to the small bunches in there. And they stay compact and they're really green. You get all that lovely sort of pyrazine character. Um, for us, we get a lot of sort of green fig character as well. And those, those characters, if it was trellis, you lose them uh, with the sun penetration. But because it's uh, bush fire and all that shade that's on the leaves, um, it actually just keeps the flowers way better. So that section I'll pick a little bit earlier, but it also, it has more hang time because of, um, because of the bush vine and all that rigor and the, there's not a big fluctuation of temperature. Um, so for me, it's really amazing working with this old bush vine block. Um, you get like, it's the same block and I can get totally different characters um, off this block. And the bottom section will be a week later um, than the top section. And that's just to due to the rootstock as well. So there's a lot of factors at play um, in this block itself. Now. And then to do that, um, uh, it, the, uh, for this block, I do a, a blanc fumé, but in that sense, I more use the wood as, um, as a vessel just to calm down a bit of that um, pyrazine character I get from the bottom section. So and in that sense also, I use a bigger barrel. Uh, I use about a three, 400 liter barrel, a combination of the two. As I'm not looking for that over woody character, I'm just sort of looking at just to help a bit in the mid palette and just to sort of round the wine off for me, um, just to add a little bit of elegance and length to the wine. So it's normally not more than 20% that it will be. Uh, and uh, when, when you think of the regions of Sauvignon Blanc around the world, what are the ones that inspire you the most? Because I mean, I know we all like to feel like we're in, we're in a bubble just trying to express our terroir, but again, we are humans. So what informs your idea when you're blending at the end, that's the ultimate decision-making process, right? You're literally deciding what flavors go into the bottle and what don't. So what are the areas that inspire you when you guys are involved in the blending process right at the end? Um, yeah, there's a lot of, like I worked a bit in Tasmania. I really enjoyed the wines some of Lanka made there. Um, Loire is always going to be a big inspiration, but uh, for me, it's also, I get more inspired about tasting more local producers and seeing what the guys locally produce um, and what they're pushing, what styles they're going for and certain aspects they're looking for. Um, for me, that's more important sort of to see what uh, people in my own country is doing, winemakers. Um, it sort of drives me more to try and aspire and do better stuff. Um, I feel that's got more impact on my way of winemaking and style I'm producing than trying to aspire to um, someone in a different country. Yes, it is good to taste it, but it's, I'll never be able to produce it. So I look for more inspiration locally um, to inspire me. That's exciting. I guess that, speak, that speaks to what Elia was saying at the beginning about you know, brand South Africa Sauvignon Blanc. Why shouldn't we have a, a solidarity within our own shores that enables us to produce and express better Sauvignon Blanc for the world to discover? Yeah. So thank you, Alex, and thanks, thanks for the time you've taken to share. We are now 80 minutes into a, an official 90 minute slot, and I, I don't want to, to drag it on any longer uh, than is necessary, but I would love to know if the panel has perhaps any parting comments that they'd like to share, perhaps something that I cut short or a conversation that they want to explore more fully. Now is, now is the time. Take that as a, is that, is that a big silent no? <laughs> oh, no I, I can perhaps um, just comment on something also. Um, so you were asking earlier about different technologies and um, advancements in, in the industry and with Sauvignon Blanc. And I just think it's important to mention, you know, also from my side, being from a research and, and very much strong in the technical side of things, that all of these uh, technological advancements, things like the yeast train, um, uh, the reductive presses and things that you say it's taking, it, it might be, not, let's let's say manipulating some of the um, the wine styles and taking away perhaps some of the terroir. And I must say, maybe I didn't understand you quite correctly, but 
I believe that some of these advancements they are just tools for the winemaker to really bring out the full potential that is already in the grapes. You can't take any grapes and just create, you know, um, something. The potential needs to be there to start with. And some of these tools that the winemakers get or, or have or obtain, they it's basically just there to help and release that full potential and to get what what really is in the grapes into the into the bottle and into the glass. Yeah, no, I, I think that's beautifully articulated, and and I think it is easy to make the um, make the mistake of seeing them as mutually exclusive. If you have, you know, you talked about precision in the cellar and and the ability to measure, just the ability to know exactly what's going on. Um, and we talked about the improvement in vessels; those can be seen as. Uh, interventions, or they can just be seen as giving the winemaker a clearer idea of what's going on. So I think what you're saying is really important. Is that having access to that knowledge and being analytical doesn't mean that you're throwing the concept of terroir out the window. Agreed. I think, but equally on the, on the other side of the spectrum, and we talked about this as well, you can be biodynamic and make wine naturally and still employ winemaking techniques that obscure the idea of terroir anyway. And I think that this is what makes Sauvignon Blanc so fascinating. Um, so I think with that, unless there are any parting comments, I think perhaps we can, we can wrap it up there. Charles, you don't have any more questions for the doctor? Okay. All right, well, then I'd like to thank you guys. I'd like to thank Charles, Karim, Arya in his absence, Nushka, Alex. Your insights have been invaluable in, in helping us to better appreciate just the incredible depth and complexity to be found in a grape that ironically is, is often mistaken as being, you know, your favorite summer poolside quaffer. And, and I feel like there are just so many follow-up conversations that, that can be had on this topic alone. So thank you so much for sparking those ideas. And then for those of you at home who enjoyed the conversation, I just wanted to remind you that this is just one of a whole series of webinars and podcasts hosted by Vinimark. So the webinars are available for viewing on the Vinimark YouTube channel, and the podcasts are available on the Vinimark podcast channel, uh, also both on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts, as well as on the Vinimark website under the News tab. So thank you to you all once again for joining us. If you've been tuning in from, from the States, we'd like to wish you all the best in celebrating National Pharmacy Technician Day. We always know that's, that's a big one. Uh, and uh, if you've been tuning in locally, then it may not be National Pharmacy Technician Day, but we want to thank you for joining us anyway, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much and goodbye. <laughs>